During the Second World War in the winter of 1944-45, a German blockade cut off supplies of food to the western provinces of the Netherlands. This caused a famine that affected about 4 million people and had killed around 20,000 before liberation in May 1945. But the Dutch winter famine had a much longer legacy. A longitudinal study carried out by Professor David Barker five decades later found that a sample of people born to mothers who were in the first three months of pregnancy during the famine had significantly higher incidences of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease and cancer in their adult lives. So could there be a link between the mother's experience of the winter famine and the health of their children many years later? Barker believed there was, and he called this the fetal susceptibility hypothesis. But how could this happen? Conventional genetics just didn't have an answer. Now, if you only again think about this from a genetic standpoint, you would say, well, there's no known mechanism by which this can occur. And to a great degree, people just sort of laughed it off and didn't really think of it as being serious and sort of shoved it under the rug. But then in 2003 at Duke University, Professor Jertle and a colleague, Rob Waterland, conducted a groundbreaking experiment with some specially bred large yellow agouti mice. The results were extraordinary. And suddenly it wasn't so easy to laugh off the fetal susceptibility hypothesis and shove it under the rug. This is the story of an experiment that not only demonstrated fetal susceptibility, but also helped open up a whole new way of looking at genetics. last quarter of the 20th century, it was widely believed that most diseases were caused by genetic mutations, so-called faulty genes. And this would become much clearer once the human genome had been mapped. But despite the hype, the headlines, and the hundred billion dollars investment in research, there's been relatively little progress. Only a handful of these genetic findings had any real significance for human health and it seems few diseases are actually caused by a faulty gene. So could researchers have been missing something by just focusing on the genome? In effect, you're missing half of the, uh, half of the story, at least half, maybe even more than half of the story. Because I think of the genome being comparable to the hardware of a computer, and I think of the epigenome as being comparable to the software that tells the computer when, where, and how to work. The study of the relationship between this genetic hardware and software it's called epigenetics, and this is how it works. The genome, the hardware, contains the blueprint for making and maintaining an organism. But that's not enough. Cells need a further set of instructions, and they get these from the epigenome, the software, a multitude of chemical compounds that attach themselves to DNA and the proteins surrounding it, and regulate which genes are actually expressed, and when. One of the ways this happens is for a process called methylation, where chemical tags, small molecules called methyl groups, one carbon atom bonded to three hydrogen, attach themselves to a gene and block access to it, effectively turning it off, like a switch. So how can we illustrate the effect of the epigenome? Simple, you're looking at it. Skin cells, hair cells, eye cells, teeth cells and so on, all clearly different, but genetically identical. So how can that happen? It happens through the early stages of development and those different regions are in different cells are told to turn on or turn off and you create, in effect, these different cell types because they were told early on, you're gonna be a liver cell, you're gonna be a tongue cell, you're gonna be an eye cell, etc. And once those programs are set early in development, they're faithfully replicated throughout adulthood. So it seems that our destiny is not just determined by our genetic hardware, our DNA but also how our genetic software, our epigenome, has programmed it to operate. And the absolutely key thing here, giving us a whole new take on nature nurture, is that this programming is shaped by environmental factors, such as the air we breathe, the stresses we're exposed to, and above all, by the food we eat. Professor Jertle calls the study of this interaction between nature and nurture environmental epigenomics. You had environmental factors that were altering the epigenome and this programming. And there are different stages of development and during our life where that 
those genetic marks are more susceptible for the environment to come in and change them, usually in a negative way. And the most critical period during development is right after fertilization because that's when all the different cell types are developing. So could this give us some insight into what might have happened to those tiny embryos during the Dutch winter famine? Could their mother's lack of nutrition at a crucial time in their development have affected their epigenome and their subsequent health as adults? We've all heard the phrase, you are what you eat, but the fetal susceptibility hypothesis suggests that there could be more to it. Could you also be what your mother ate or didn't eat? And if so, could this actually be demonstrated? This is what the Agouti Mouse Study set out to do. All mice, indeed all mammals, have an agouti gene that controls the distribution of dark pigment. But that gene can be expressed very differently. And it's hard to believe that these mice are identical genetically. They're inbred, so they're genetically, the genotype of all the offspring is identical, but they vary greatly in their appearance. So you have some animals that are completely brown and thin. As they get older, they stay normal weight. And then you have other animals that are completely blonde. They're, and they get obese, have a high incidence of diabetes and high incidence of cancer. And as the genotype of these mice was identical, these differences could only be explained through changes in gene expression. The characteristics of the large yellow mice were brought about by something called a transposon. That is a rogue viral segment of DNA that moves or jumps to different positions in a cell, a bit like cut and paste, and this can change gene expression. The yellow mice had a transposon right next to the agouti gene that made it overproduce a protein that not only made them yellow, but also blocked the feeding control centre in the brain, making them obese. And this was inheritable. So the large yellow mice had a high proportion of yellow pups, also destined to become obese early and get sick. But Jertle and Waterland wondered whether this sad destiny might be changed environmentally. So the basic question was, can we change the phenotype in the animal, in this case coat colour, by alterations in the epigenome? So they divided mothers-to-be into two groups. Mothers in the experimental group were put on diets rich in nutrients containing methyl groups, such as chlorine, folic acid and vitamin B12, while those in the control group remained on ordinary mouse food. And then they waited. And I remember telling Rob, I said, either we're going to be famous with this experiment or we're going to be going down in flames. And by that I meant we were going to go broke. But they didn't go broke because they'd actually changed the heritage of many of the baby mice. Good diet, methyl donor mums had a much higher proportion of lean brown pups than the controls. Genetic destinies altered environmentally. So what was that like for the researchers? So when we started seeing this incredible increase in brown animals and then demonstrating that this was absolutely linked to the level of methylation at this region that's known to control this gene expression, it first to me was just a big sigh of relief that the experiment actually worked. They were able to show how methylation from the vitamin B diets had, in the majority of cases, silenced the transposon, just turned it off. So when that viral element, this transposable element, is methylated and turned off, you go to the normal developmental regulation of that agouti gene and you get brown offspring. Whereas when that region is unmethylated very early in development, the Goody gene is turned on all over the animal continuously throughout its life and the animal is yellow. This was the first ever study that didn't just suggest or argue, but actually demonstrated a causal pathway between a mother's diet and the expression of her offspring's genetic code. And in the process, they challenged a century scientific belief by showing that you might actually inherit more than just your parents' genes. So what did the world make of the agouti mice experiment? Jertle and Waterland's study was published in August 2003. It was front page. And was quickly picked up by major newspapers, magazines and TV programmes in the United States. And very soon, 
it was global. And it's easy to see why. For decades there'd been all this research linking parental diet to their offspring's health. But the explanation had been missing until now. It made this paper bigger than, almost bigger than life. And so both Rob and I and most of my students were out now being asked to give many, many talks about because it was the mechanism by which the environment could affect you know, the expression of genes and thereby alter susceptibilities to diseases. Obesity and the health problems it brings with it had been seen as a product of genetic predisposition and bad lifestyle choices. Now here, it seemed, was another cause. The nourishment an embryo receives from its mother. But, and it's a big but, to what extent can a finding from specially bred laboratory mice be applied to humans? That finding can be extrapolated to humans, but we don't know what environmental things change the epigenome in humans, and even more importantly, maybe, we don't know the targets. In other words, what are the genes that are being altered? But we have the tools now to be able to do this because we now know what we need to be looking for, which are epigenetic changes. And the Uguti mouse study had provided a valuable model system to work from. And it gave the impetus to generate a mass of new research looking at how methylation patterns might influence the health of humans. For example, longitudinal research at the University of Southampton, Professor Barker's department, analysed levels of methylation in the umbilical cord of newborn babies. They found that lower levels of DNA methylation in the CDKN2A gene that helps regulate fat cells was associated with greater fat tissue in the child at four years old, putting it at greater risk of obesity in later life. Findings that were duplicated by similar research in Singapore with over 12,000 babies and in the RAIN study of nearly 3,000 babies in Western Australia. And the influence of the Agouti mouse study extended beyond fetal susceptibility. It was also a milestone in the newly developing science of epigenetics. It changed completely the way we view adult disease susceptibility. Before our study was done, you can look at the literature, there, the, the, the word epigenetic never showed up in the literature. It truly was a black box. After that study was complete, that black box was opened up and the word epigenetic is present in every report, basically, that is now written. And the increasing knowledge of the role of epigenetic factors in disease has led to a massive increase in research into epigenetic treatments for a range of diseases, including cancer, respiratory diseases, and dementias. This bringing together of the genome and the epigenome, the other half of the story, the genetic software, may hold answers to some of the mysteries that classical genetic approaches have been unable to solve. So I think of the epige epigenetics as being, as I say, the, sort of the science of hope. We can do things to alter the epigenome where it would be very difficult, it's going to be very difficult to go in and change the genome itself. The Aguti mouse study is now one of the most widely cited studies, not just in genetics, but in the history of science. Because it demonstrated beyond doubt that environmental factors can reprogram genetic inheritance for better or worse.